everybody, this is 22 Tiger Dude here, and I'm here to review Ghostbusters 2. So, Ghostbusters 2 is directed by Ivan Reitman. The film is written by Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis. And of course, the film stars Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, Annie Potts, Rick Moranis, and Sigourney Weaver. And Ghostbusters 2 takes place five years after the events of the original film. And five years later, you know the Ghostbusters have gone their separate ways. But the Ghostbusting business they've once had has them bankrupt and they have to deal with these lawsuits and court orders. So the gang gets back together and it's up to them to revive the business when they discover that beneath the city that there is this ectoplasm. So it's up to the Ghostbusters to try to get rid of this ectoplasm and basically save the city of New York. So before I review Ghostbusters 2, you guys, my guest star Joe Tufano is going to be reviewing this film. He reviewed the original film with me a couple of years ago along with CNN and IMAX, and now he is back to be reviewing the sequel with me. So Joe, take it away. Hey everybody at 22 Tiger Dude's channel, I'm Joe Tufano and thank you Tiger Dude for having me back to review Ghostbusters 2. I talked about the first Ghostbusters on this channel with the Tiger Dude about two years ago for the 30th anniversary re-release of the original Ghostbusters. And with the Ghostbusters reboot coming up soon, yeah, <laughs> we decided to give our thoughts on Ghostbusters 2, a sequel that some people have debated about over the years. And believe it or not, this was the first Ghostbusters movie that I was introduced to. I wouldn't really consider myself a fan of the franchise, but I think the first Ghostbusters is a pretty good movie, personally. Not my all-time favorite movie, but I could definitely recognize why people list it as their favorite movie. And for years, I never really knew exactly what the consensus was on this movie until I looked up some reviews from people like Oliver Harper or even seeing Siskel and Ebert's original review from 1989. People thought at the time that this was just a retread and that everyone was so tired and just the same kind of thing we saw all the time and no charm. And having watched it recently, I, I watched the movie a few hours ago, I can safely say that this is definitely not as good as the original. I mean, was it ever going to be? A sequel to any movie that's really, really great, like Star Wars or The Dark Knight, it's never going to be as good as seeing that stuff the, the first time around. But then again, anything good could come out of it. And from what I can tell, a lot of people over the years since its release, people have started to become a little bit more positive towards this. And watching it now, its flaws are noticeable, for me anyway. But I think it's a pretty good time. It's not perfect though. It still has some of the stuff that we saw in the original movie. First of all, the interplay between the four Ghostbusters is still spot on. Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray, Harold Ramis, may he rest in peace, and Ernie Hudson. They're still great together. They still have a lot of great funny moments, especially Bill Murray. Hairless pets. Weird. Ah, oh, no, 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 I can't. Uh, Dana Barrett. Come on, big boy. I'm going to bring you home to my private zoo. It's nice to see Sigourney Weaver back. Annie Potts. <laughs> Ghostbusters. Yes, we're back. Although I wonder what happened to her and Egon, because there seemed to be a romantic connection of some sort between the two of them. It's never brought up, which again, if we're going to talk about the negatives, let's talk about those. I don't really like the inclusion of Peter McNichol's character. Uh, I honestly was never a big fan of him, and watching it now, I honestly found him to be really annoying, and I found myself cringing a little bit. I don't really think he was necessary. And I feel the same for Rick Moranis' character, Lewis. In the first movie, he was... Okay. Okay. Yeah. Alright. And I feel like they kind of overdo it a little bit in this one. But towards the end, I, I actually think he's fine. And also, towards the climax of the movie, there's this one part that never gets brought up again. Dana seems to be intrigued by the idea of raising a god with her baby son, Oscar. This painting of this guy named Vigo is trying to transport his soul into this baby so he can be reborn. And Peter McNichol's character is trying to get her to warm up to this idea, and she seems to be okay with it, but then once the climax starts happening, it's gone. It, it's never brought up again. It was just like some random thing, like, w w wait a second, why were you so into this? Were you trying to get the drop on him? Were you trying to sneak off of the baby, or what? It's never explained, but nevertheless, there is still a lot of good to be had here, like I said, with the four team members. And also, one thing I noticed with this movie, there's a lot of creepy imagery in this movie. When you see Peter McNichol, kind of talking to himself. He's not really paying attention to the painting. And the face of the guy in the portrait just kind of creeps out and leans out to look towards him. Ugh. And also the tunnel scene when Ray 
Winston and Egon are walking through the tunnel and those heads start popping up and that ghost train comes through. This is probably the closest to a scary movie that I will see because, yeah, I'm a big wuss when it comes to scary movies. And some of the special effects, I think, hold up really well. It's a little noticeable. It's 1980s. But mostly, I think it looks good. Like, with the two ghosts in the courtroom scene, the Scolari brothers. It's, it's, it's a fun sequence. It's cool to see the Ghostbusters back in action again. And then some of the other ghosts you got around here, like when the rampage starts happening across the city. Like, with the fur coat and those mole-looking things popping up going, Gah! And the Titanic showing up. Well... Better late than never. Which brings us into the Statue of Liberty sequence. I have always liked that part. Some people would say that it's too reminiscent of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, that they needed something more original. Well, not to go off topic here, but in a franchise like Ghostbusters, you expect certain things like that to happen. There's going to be certain things that are similar, like with Star Wars, like with Spider-Man or Batman, Marvel, y you get the idea. I wasn't too bothered by it because I like how it played into the idea of bringing out the positivity in the citizens of New York. New York, like any other big metro area, can be very cynical and miserable because of all the corruption and all the evil and violence and anger that is prominent throughout, which also builds the river of slime building underneath the sewers of New York City, which Vigo, in the painting, is building off of. And it also shows that the positivity is his weakness and that Ghostbusters are able to use that to their advantage. I, I like how the Statue of Liberty is used, and, and watching this, I want to know who sang the cover of this song. Higher and higher. <laughs> That's terrible. I'm sorry. Since I mentioned that song, I also like Bobby Brown's song On Our Own. It's very reminiscent of the time that it came out in, 1989. I always like that. It brings out some kind of nostalgic feeling for me. And it also reminds me of New York City. That you, I get that whole New York City vibe when I hear that, if you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, one more negative that I also forgot to bring up. When Peter McNichols' character sees... Vigo's spirit talking to him, he doesn't really seem to question what's going on. Granted, he did get zapped in the eyes by the painting, so he was my control throughout the rest of the movie. So there's really probably nothing he could do about it, but before then, he was just going, Oh, command me, Lord! Not once was he like, what's going on here? Am I going nuts? He never once questions it. it it's really cool, I guess. But all that aside, <laughs> overall, I think Ghostbusters 2 is a pretty fun sequel. Nowhere near as good as the original. But then again, was it ever going to be? Some of the flaws are noticeable, but I would say I could definitely see myself watching it again if I was in the mood for it. All right, those are my thoughts on Ghostbusters 2. Thanks, Tiger Dude, for having me on your channel. And now, back to you. Thank you so much, Joe Tefano, for reviewing Ghostbusters 2. So, when it comes to my thoughts on Ghostbusters 2, you know, with the original film, the original film, first of all, before I even get to my thoughts on Ghostbusters 2, it's an iconic film. I think the first film is great. I wouldn't say it's one of my all-time favorite movies like it is to a lot of people, but I think it's a great film. The comedy is fantastic. The cast is great. The chemistry is great. And yeah, I just think the original Ghostbusters is a lot of fun. It's great. So with this sequel, you know, this is a sequel that people either enjoy, all right, okay on, or they just think it's a very bad sequel. And where do I stand when it comes to Ghostbusters 2, a sequel to an iconic original film? I thought Ghostbusters 2 was okay. It was okay, yeah. I don't think it's a bad sequel. It's not a good sequel. I just think it's all right. You know, it's an alright sequel. But of course, the good things about Ghostbusters is that one, the movie, you know, just like with the original film, it does have its entertainment value. You could still get behind with the characters. I still think Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, and Ernie Hudson, they still make a great team. And it's so nice to see that Ernie Hudson is more involved here than he was in the original because one of my faults with the original that I didn't get to mention in my review a couple of years ago is that I do feel like Ernie Hudson was just shoehorned into the group at the very last minute with him only have really one scene of ghost busting and that was a climax so he felt like a background character and while yes there's times where he still feels like a background character in this film he actually feels like he's part of the team because in the original Ghostbusters, you know, even though I like Ernie Hudson, the original, I'm going, all right, Bill Murray, Harold Ramis, Dan Aykroyd, and uh, that 
that guy over there, yeah, they saved the day. But no, in this one, I'm actually cheering for Ernie Hudson here as well because he's actually more involved here, and I really appreciate that. So Gurney Weaver, I really enjoyed her here. I still really enjoyed Rick Moranis, and I really enjoyed Annie Potts as, of course, the receptionist. As far as these guys go, they still do a very good job giving very solid performances. Cinematography, I do think, is very well shot in the movie. I really enjoy how it was shot. It's just like the original film, basically. And from Ivan Reitman, it is a very well-directed movie. Some of the visual effects in this film do look good. They still really hold up, just like how a lot of the visual effects in the original film really do hold up very well. And the ghost-busting scenes, those are still very entertaining to watch. I really love the ghost-busting scenes, and then the whole concept of this ectoplasm that the guys uh, discover you know, beneath the city. I actually think that's a very cool concept that this film handled. And the comedy in the film, I actually still really enjoy. It's not as funny as the original film, personally, but you still have some of that witty dialogue that you get from the original film. But, when it comes to my problems for Ghostbusters 2, honestly, one of my problems with the film is that even though some of the visual effects do look really good, most of the visual effects, unfortunately, do not hold up. I don't really think the visual effects in this film, this time around, for the most part, really impressed me. I thought they could have been polished better. In this sequel, some visual effects were really damn good, but for the most part, yeah, I just thought they could have looked better, and I kept going, hmm, that could have looked a lot better. Even Slimer. Slimer didn't look anywhere near as good as he did in the original film. And not just that, but he looked really, really different. And you know, just like with the original film, there is like a good 10 to 15 minute section of this movie where I did feel like the pacing was a little bit slow. And yes, while the film does have a different concept from the original film, when I really look at Ghostbusters 2, a lot of the moments feel too familiar with the original film. Like, honestly, it does feel like it's a rehash of the original film. Just how certain scenes were executed. Rick Moranis, I didn't think he really needed to be in this film. And I really enjoyed him, you know? I thought he did serve some purpose for the original film. But in this film, even when he's trying to do something at the end, you are going, yeah, even when we get to the climax, he still felt pretty damn pointless. I thought the relationship with him and Annie Potts, you know, the receptionist, didn't really feel like that entire plot was really going anywhere. Sure, were there a few cute scenes dealing with Rick Moranis and Annie Potts? Sure, but I did feel like that plot wasn't really going anywhere. The other problem I had with this film was Dr. Peter. I thought Dr. Peter throughout this film was honestly very selfish. Like, he wasn't really thinking about others. He was just thinking about himself and wanting to get close to Sir Gurney Weaver. Like, that's all he was thinking about. He wasn't really caring for the dangers of the city. Like, there's a serious thing going on with Sir Gurney Weaver's baby. And, you know, there's this whole ectoplasm thing. But... He doesn't seem to be very concerned by it. He was just really thinking about himself and trying to get close to Sigourney Weaver because he loves her. The finale of the film does go by too quick in my opinion. Like, it's still fun to watch because, you know, of the whole ghost busting. How the whole finale resolves. It feels like it gets resolved a little too fast. Well, way too fast for that matter. And Peter McNichol... He was utterly useless. I really did not see why he really needed to be in this film. Like, he does serve for the sorcerer, but even then, I can't help but watch the movie going. What was really the point of this guy being in this film? And I was actually also very irritated by his character, too. Every time he pops up on screen, every time he says something, I honestly get really annoyed by him. And overall, you guys, Ghostbusters 2, I do consider to be just 
an okay sequel. It's not bad, it's not good, it's just an average sequel at best in my opinion. There's still the entertainment value, the chemistry with the Ghostbusters team is definitely there. Nice to see Ernie Hudson more involved here in this film. Sigourney Weaver, Rick Moranis, Annie Potts are still really good. Ivan Reitman still does a great job directing this film. There's definitely good things in this film, but the problem is that it does try to be too much like the original film to the point where even though it's trying to capture the magic of the original film, it doesn't quite have that magic. It's definitely entertaining, it, there's definitely fun moments in this film, but it just doesn't quite have the magic of the original film. So I'm going to give Ghostbusters 2 two and a half out of four stars. So you guys, in the comments down below, let me know what you think about Ghostbusters 2 and what you think about Ghostbusters 1984 as well. And I would also love to give a huge thank you to my guest star, Joe Tofano. Joe is such a really cool guy. He does more reviews on his channel. He does podcasts on his channel. So if you guys want to check out his channel, I'm going to leave a link to his channel in the description down below. This is 22 Tiger Dude here, and don't forget that I will always have Tiger Power!